how secure is the supply of uh, raw materials? Uh, this session will be delivered by IHS Market uh, with Celine, who is a principal research analyst focusing on battery materials, and uh, Stefan, who is an executive director at IHS Market. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the, you know, for giving us the opportunity to present today on what we think is a really an, an interesting and hot topic. Um, and, and, and that is because, you know, if you open journals and newspapers these days, you can almost be certain uh, that you find an article about battery raw materials. Uh, and in most cases, bold headlines announce shortages of raw materials, skyrocketing prices, unethical practices in the mines where the raw materials are produced, or claims that the lack of sustainability uh, in raw material production makes electric vehicles just as environmentally unfriendly as the normal car. Now, in this presentation, we would like to present you the underlying data of the battery raw material markets that we gathered over the past years. And we'll combine our data with the expertise of our IHS market automotive team and their outlook on the EV market and share our fact based view on those bold claims that you can read in the press. We, that is uh, Celine, who you just saw, uh, and myself, and we both work in the battery raw material team of IHS market. You will hear from me in the first part, how we see the market grow and develop over the next years. And in the second part, Celine will look at the supply side and answer the question if and how supply can cope with future demand. No. Yeah, but uh, please allow a brief introduction of our company, IHS Market. IHS Market is an information provider. Our information is used by around 50,000 clients around the world. Uh, to highlight just a few examples from this slide, 94 out of 100 of the largest US companies are using our information, as do essentially all of the largest banks, oil companies, and automotive companies around the world. Now, as you will see in the course of this presentation, the ability to interconnect areas of expertise is extremely valuable in order to obtain a complete view of a market and its perspective. The circle here shows all areas of expertise within IHS market and for the battery raw material market presentation today, we will build on the expertise of our own uh, chemical group specializing on battery raw materials, then obviously on the expertise of the automotive colleagues uh, and their view on the future of electromobility of course, the expertise of our colleagues in the energy department and their view on the future of grid storage, colleagues from maritime and trade for information about commodity trade volumes and prices, expertise from our colleagues in the ESG and climate change team and their expertise in battery technology, but also expertise from our colleagues in the economics and country risk team for specific information about the political and economic conditions in specific countries. So uh, maybe a quarter to a third of all the cycle, uh, circles here that you see areas of expertise that flow into the analysis that you will hear today from us. And um, as mentioned, Celine and I will present the two parts of the presentation. Uh, I will start with the factors that impact future demand. Obviously, demand growth of battery raw materials is closely linked to the growth of electromobility. And I will look into this factor in some detail. But it is not only the number of electric vehicles that needs to be taken into account, but also technological aspects that favor one raw material over another. And this is particularly true for cathode technology, as you will see. And last but not least, demand will depend on the cost structure of batteries. How much does raw material cost contribute to overall battery cost? Or 
what could be the impact of a shortage and subsequent price increase to the overall battery cost and competitivity accordingly of electric vehicles. Part two, presented by uh, Celine, you'll see how supply of battery raw materials is expected to develop in the next years quantitatively as tons of product, but also qualitatively. Will the raw materials that can be supplied meet the standards of environmental and social sustainability criteria? With that, I want to start my part on demand and uh, and here, you know, whenever you open a newspaper, as I said these days, you come across an article, in most cases, bold headline on the lack of raw materials for battery production. Now, the w w one thing that intrigues maybe some people just like me, why do people care so much for battery raw materials these days? I mean, anything material that we have and use is made from some raw material. And it is rather uncommon to read articles about the raw materials they are made from. And some of these goods may even be more important than batteries. So what's the point of about batteries and battery raw materials? And one explanation is that the electrification of transportation is key to whether or not the world will achieve its goals on carbon neutrality. And the switch towards electromobility would be slowed down if raw materials were not available for the production of batteries. People are also concerned raw material shortages could drive prices up so that the battery cost might increase to an extent that electromobility could not compete with internal combustion engines, which would in turn also uh, slow the switch to electromobility down. And that is why I'm now taking a look at, at the contribution of raw material cost to the overall cost of, of battery production. And that's what this graph shows. It shows overall battery cell costs. So batteries consist of, of a number of cells uh, in, in the battery that are you know, assembled together. But it's essentially the, the, the functional part in the battery is the cell. And this graph shows overall uh, cell costs for different cathode types of lithium ion batteries and a forecast to 2030. And you see here different color codes, different cathode types, and you'll see later on in more detail what these cathode um, types are and, and, and what the differences are between the different types, just to show you here um, that raw material cost is different for different um, cathode types. And, and in the last years, as you can see here, uh, lithium-ion battery cell prices have decreased, and this trend is expected to continue. If we went a lot further to the left-hand side, you'd see, you know, um, his, to more historical data, that decrease would be even more pronounced than than, than what you see here. Uh, and and you see also that the uh, that the, the price decrease is expected to continue um, to further lower the price of electric cars and bring cost parity between um, combustion engines and the electric car. And battery cost decline is primarily driven by economies of scale and technology improvements. The decline in 2018 and 2020 to 2020 was then in addition accompanied by relatively low um, raw material prices and the increase, the small increase that you see here with the red cycle, uh, that's uh, um, the effect that we see at the moment, higher battery uh, cost overall because of the very high raw material prices at the moment. Now, if we take a deeper look into the battery pack cost, you will understand uh, why so much is written about the battery cathode raw materials these days. The first column on the left hand side shows the cost of a battery pack of an electric car at around $140 per kilowatt hour. The battery consists of multiple cells, as I say, and the cost contribution of these cells is represented by the green part of that bar. The gray portion on top 
of the power presents the cost of other parts that are required to build the battery. The cost of a cell breaks down into the manufacturing and the cost of its main components, which are shown in the second column in the middle. These are these components are the cathode, the anode, and other components like electrolyte, separator, uh, and so on. The cathode accounts for the largest part of the cost of battery illustrated in the pie chart on the right side. The analysis is made for NMC 622 cathode material, which is today the most used and widespread technology. The third column on the left-hand side of that NMC cathode breakdown shows why nickel, lithium and cobalt play a key role in the transition towards electromobility. Um, and that is because of their cost contribution. Uh, the cathode share of pack cost increased from around 30 to 40 percent from 2020 um, to 21 driven by metal prices and manufacturing cost declined as expected in the same period. Now what you see here in the next slide is the flexibility with uh, some examples of raw materials um, you know and, and the, the assumption that is that is made here or the assumption or, or you know what's calculated here for these three examples of graphite, copper and aluminum, all three uh, raw materials used in the battery is um, uh, the assumption is that raw material prices would either half or would double. And what would that what would the impact be on the overall battery cost? Uh, and that's shown on the vertical on the vertical scale. And you see here in the middle example of copper, for example, that a doubling of the price of copper, for example, would end up in a 25% cost increase of overall battery cost. So again, uh, an example that raw material cost does have a remarkable impact on the overall battery cost and that probably or you know is an explanation to a good extent why so much discussion is ongoing around battery raw materials now with that i'll turn to the more immediate factors of raw material consumption and that is on one hand the expected growth of battery use and on the other hand the expected changes and a description of technology and the impact of raw material uh, from the technology side we've just seen that raw material cost is one of the drivers of technology changes and developments going forward We've also seen that raw material cost does affect overall battery cost and accordingly the economic viability of electromobility. The next and probably most obvious factor that determines how much battery raw materials will be consumed in the future is the number of batteries that will be produced and used in the future. And this is shown in this graphic on this slide. It shows historic battery uses on the left hand side uh, all the way to 2015 but most important obviously the outlook to the year 2030 you see overall impressive growth expected in the next years and you also see that the share of battery use in transportation is very large as compared to other battery uses in portable devices or for stationary energy short, uh, storage. Now, uh, before I go uh, into, into more detail, there was one remark I wanted to make on, on battery raw materials and the different situation that we're in if we look at battery raw materials. And, and that is regarding the question and, and, and that also impacts the question on whether or not uh, supply will be able to follow uh, the rapid increase of demand that, that we see uh, uh, coming. And that not only depends you know, on, on how fast the market is growing, but it also um, depends on what portion of the overall 
raw material consumption batteries constitute. And let me explain this point at the example of the raw materials, lithium and nickel. In the case of nickel battery consumption represents a relatively small part here indicated with the you know long, low number of bars of yellow bars in in in, in the nickel part um, represents a relatively small part of the market much more nickel is consumed in steel so the required addition of capacities is in this case rather small relatively small as compared to the overall market and in the case of lithium battery consumption consumes way more than half of all lithium that is being consumed globally and in all downstream uses of the market. Now, the additional new capacities are accordingly big relatively to, relative to the overall market size of lithium, and accordingly, it takes a relatively larger effort for these new capacities to be installed. So that idea, uh, I wanted to, to, to show that before we go into more detail in the overall um, view and outlook for the for the um, battery markets now, as you can see here in this in this slide demand for lithium iron batteries is growing rapidly 12 times battery demand expected um, in 2030 as compared to 2020 by two and electric vehicles shown in the green parts Low, lower green parts of the bars are the main driver of battery raw materials demand. Stationary energy storage systems will also be increasingly required to cope with supply fluctuations of renewable energy sources. But the overall number will remain small as compared to electromobility. Hence, volumes of battery raw materials consumed in their production will remain relatively modest. Now, we've just seen that raw material cost is indeed an, an import, important to overall battery cost. And we've seen that the overall battery market can be reasonably expected to grow rapidly. Growth will, however, not be the same for the different raw materials that we're talking about today. And that is because rapid development is ongoing in the battery space. And these developments that are ongoing lead to material preferences favoring the use of certain raw materials and avoiding the use of other raw materials. And the areas of development are shown in this slide. And, uh, and it's uh, the five areas of development in the battery that are important and that are very dynamic. And that's on one hand, um, in order to improve energy density and energy density is um, the factor that determines the range of the vehicle on one charge, uh, then development ongoing uh, with you to the power density of the battery, which in turn um, has an impact on, on the ability to charge and to rapidly charge a battery and to accelerate the car, then um, lifespan of the battery, an area of development, which is important. Obviously, the number of recharging cycles uh, and, and, and the necessity to replace the old battery to, to maximize the overall lifetime of a battery, obviously an important point. Also, um, with view to the overall relatively high cost of the battery in the overall cost of an electrical car. Then cost, obviously um, an important parameter overall battery production cost, an important parameter uh, that companies um, try to optimize. And then last but not least, safety, make sure that the fires um, that we've seen in electric cars remain an exception and can be avoided in the future. Now, when we talk about battery technology and battery raw materials, it is the cathode chemistry. Uh, that's in the center of our attention. Um, it is the most resource intensive part of the battery. It's the most expensive part of the lithium ion battery and its properties have an impact on all the parameters that we see here in that slide. Now let, let me explain you a little bit on 
the different cathode materials and and uh, how you know what, what the development is that's ongoing and how that affects raw material markets the chart here visualizes the different cathode types of lithium ion batteries and their development from 2015 to 2019 in that period development was driven by energy density High energy density is equivalent to a large range that an electric vehicle can drive on a single charging cycle. And range fear was one of the most important reasons that kept people from buying electric vehicles. And accordingly, auto manufacturers, and most importantly in that period, Tesla had to tackle this issue first. And NMC technology was the technology that allowed for higher energy density and larger range. And you see here in this period, 2015 to 2019, how NMC cathode shares increased and became the dominant technology. And that's all um, the parts of the bar that are indicated in blue, which are NMC technology. Now, if we go to the current period and a shorter term outlook and see what is ongoing in terms of development and shifts of raw material consumption. The current development period you know, started around 2018 and further development is, is expected to continue in the foreseeable future here to 2026. The aim in this period, the main aim in this of, of all developments that are ongoing is to minimize the use of expensive cobalt on one hand to optimize battery cost and to replace it with a cheaper material which in this case is the nickel. The light blue parts of the bar which stand for nickel rich cathode increase as you could see in that 2018 2026 20, period at the expense of the dark blue part of the bar which stand for cobalt rich electrodes and before i come to the longer term outlook a little bit background on what drives uh outlook in the longer term and, and and this slide represents um, outlines of, of strategies uh, from Tesla and, and VW, Volkswagen as, as presented in their battery days uh, last years. And especially in the case of Tesla, there were only a few models in the market until recently that essentially were marketed for a techno feel and rather um, economically wealthy audience. And with the success in this group and the acceptance of the technology as being viable, the market now opens to a wider public with much more diverse requirements. It will not only be the most expensive, best performing batteries that will be built into these wide variety of car types, but battery choices will increasingly be a compromise on price and performance and this needs to be factored in uh, if we make a forecast for future raw material requirements in batteries and with that uh, I want to come to our longer term outlook and what we see the trends we see here um, and the effect on raw material prices now looking into uh, the more distant future a variety of diverse factors will have an impact on cathode chairs as well as on the areas of development. First factor impacting the cathode chair is diversity. With the experience and practical use of electric vehicles, range fear is reduced, as mentioned, and cars with lower range and lower energy density batteries can be part of the electric vehicle mix in the future, in the longer range. And that is the moment where LFP cathodes will start to dominate in this segment. Prices continue to be a factor to avoid cobalt, but the trend to avoid cobalt will also be spurred by issues around the social sustainability of its supply, not only by its price. The cathode mix will be dominated by nickel-rich, LFP, and manganese-rich cathodes. 
uh, with significant shares of new technologies, NMCA, LM, LNMO, NMC, uh, the cathode breakdown will be more diverse in the future than what we see today. And that is what you see here indicated with uh, a larger color range um, by the end of our forecast period. Uh, with all important shares of the of the different uh, technologies um, that are part of that diversity of electric vehicles. Now this graph shows raw material consumption for the different cathode technologies. On the left hand side you see the raw material uh, consumption for LFP cathodes, LFP stands for lithium iron phosphates. We've only listed lithium here as a critical raw material for these cathode types. As you can imagine, the relative amounts of iron and phosphorus, which stand for F and P uh, that are used in the battery are relatively negligible compared to other uses of these elements, phosphorus in um, fertilizers and iron construction, automotive and so on. So the part that goes into the battery of iron and phosphor remains relatively small, uh, almost negligible as compared to other uses. And that is why it is not a critical material in that sense uh, for its battery use. NMC stands for nickel, manganese, cobalt. Um, here, uh, the, the examples in the middle of, of uh, this slide, of course, cathodes also contain uh, lithium, even though it's not in the abbreviation. Uh, NMC cathodes exist in a wide range of compositions um, and constituents shown here are NMC333, uh, which stands for you know equal parts of nickel, manganese and cobalt, uh, and NMC811, which stands for a high nickel um, cathode, eight parts of nickel versus one part of uh, manganese and, and one part of cobalt. Um, Quantities of cobalt, nickel, and manganese do vary greatly, as you can see here in that slide, and that helps to avoid uh, high cost cobalt and to use increasing amounts of nickel. The choice of certain cathode types allows to minimize or maximize the use of nickel, cobalt, and manganese. But the amount of lithium in a battery, as you can see in the yellow bars, remains approximately the same for all the different cathode types. Now, uh, we've learned that cobalt already caused the one trend of high nickel cathodes plus with the LFP technology, it can be completely eliminated. So the question rises, yeah, why are we talking at all about cobalt? Um, and the answer is, shown in this graph uh, and, and it is that cobalt remains remains essential for electromobility so it will not go completely away and even though effort is made to replace cobalt and to go towards higher nickel uh, cathodes it is still growing at a double digit rate and uh, and that is because cobalt is important for the structural stability of the battery and the structural stability of the battery, in turn, is an important parameter for the lifetime of a battery and the number of recharging cycle that it can undergo. Um, and, and cobalt provides both and therefore remains uh, an important component of the cathode. Now, with that, I've mentioned all you know the different parameters uh, that we see important for raw material consumption in the battery and the cathode of the battery in particular. Uh, now, let me look at the uh, three critical raw materials that we were looking at um, uh, so far and see what the overall um, forecast for consumption of these materials is and start with uh, cobalt. Overall cobalt consumption is projected as follows. Co consumption is expected to grow. But for cobalt, we do not see the exponential growth that we see for other battery raw materials. And the reason 
for the lower growth, relatively lower growth, are efforts to replace cobalt in the battery. Another specialty of cobalt use in batteries is the relative larger share of the non-transportation segment. Portical electronic devices indicated here with the orange part of the bar uh, remain an important segment of, of in, within the battery space, uh, which is untypical for other battery raw materials. And the reason uh, that cobalt remains so important in the portable electronic uh, devices is the number of recharging cycles that, it, that, that is possible with cobalt-based uh, cathodes. And as you know, some of these devices, like our mobile phones, we like to charge them uh, almost every day. And, um, and still battery lifetimes of a certain number of years is expected. So cobalt uh, important will remain important in this uh, segment of the battery market. The next graph shows lithium consumption. Overall, lithium consumption expected to grow across all consumption segments. The battery segment is already, if you look at 2021, and uh, the, the orange and the green part of the bar that's, that's well visible here, so the battery part already represents for lithium the largest part of overall consumption at present. And that dominance of the battery uses is, continue, is expected to continue to grow. Lithium is used in all lithium-ion batteries, obviously, and its use is not affected by technology changes as we've seen uh, in the cathode space. Um, and so growth in battery uses will be more or less in line with the growth of overall battery capacity. Within the battery segment, electromobility is the largest growing segment, and it's shown in the green part of the bar, the upper green part of the bar here. Other areas of electromobility, such as buses, trucks, motorcycles, are also expected to grow, but their relative importance uh, is smaller, as you can see with the gr gray part of the bar just below uh, the green part of the bar. And the same is true for the battery use in portable electronic devices and for stationary energy storage indicated here with the orange and the light green parts of the bar. Um, finally, non-battery uses are represented in the blue part of the bar. Growth is modest uh, and the relative importance is decreasing. Last metal that I want to look into and consumption perspective uh, is, is nickel. Um, the graph shows that its consumption is forecast to grow. Battery segment growth is mainly because of increasing number of batteries that will be produced and used and other than cobalt, which will be replaced. Relative nickel consumption in the batteries with NMC technology is expected to grow. Growth of nickel consumption is expected to grow overall consumption segments, but with growth in the battery segment exceeding growth in the non-battery segment. Um, and with that, oh, I'm already a little bit over time. Uh, hand it over to Celine, please. Uh, you're still on mute. Oh, you've just come off. Perfect. Still on mute? No, uh, you've, ju you've just come off. It's all good. Okay, cool. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present today. As Stefan already mentioned, I'm going to talk about the supply. And the question, will supply meet future demand. Okay, that works. Um, the worldwide cobalt reserves are around 7 million tons in 2020. And half of these are located in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, also called the DRC. The second largest Reserves are in Australia with about 70% of global 
reserves. All the other countries follow with only 7% and lower shares. The current land-based reserves are estimated to present 50 years of supply calculated by the ratio reserves to production. No shortage is expected, especially when keeping in mind that the world terrestrial cobalt reserves are about 25 million tons, and that is well over 145 million tons of cobalt um, if cobalt resources on the floor of the oceans are added as well. Quick explanation. Reserves can be economically extracted with current available technology and resources include minerals which might be economic extractable with future technology. So there is less concern whether cobalt reserves are sufficient, but rather if the installed cobalt mining and recycling capacities are sufficient. Because of the term reserves, yes, it says it would be possible to mine it now economically, but it does not say that extraction facilities are in place and operative. That is why we analyze the really installed production capacities in great detail and their development. Furthermore, I'd like to address the question whether there is enough ethically mined cobalt or not. Cobalt sources can be divided into mining and recycling. Mine sources include large scale mining, abbreviated as LSM, and artisanal and small scale mining, shorted as ASM. The difference between LSM and ASM is the ratio of machine aided to manual work. ASM can be responsible, but it can also be irresponsible, illegal. In the context of irresponsible mining, for instance, child labor is an issue and inadequate safety measures that pose a risk to the health and life of involved mine workers. In addition, in addition wages are very low. ASM developments are hard to predict because artisanal miners are very price sensitive. What does that mean? Artisanal miners are very fast in responding to price changes. They use manual process, which don't require large investment. And when it's illegal, you don't really care about waiting and paying for permits and licenses. LSM developments are also hard to predict as cobalt is mined mainly as a byproduct chiefly copper and nickel. The amount of cobalt uh, mined is heavily dependent on copper and nickel markets. So yes, LSM suffers less from human rights abuses, but struggles with corruption to obtain and maintain mining licenses. The following, the focus is on mining capacities with approximately 10% shares of total supply, recycling plays a minor role so far and significant increase of influence is not expected in the forecast period up to 2026. Um, yeah. In numbers, cobalt is extracted mainly as a byproduct with 99%, and this number won't uh, much change in the forecast period. Here you can see the worldwide cobalt reserves, again highlighted in green. In gray, the actual installed capacities are visualized. Cobalt reserves and installed capacities are similar, but the cobalt capacity concentration on the DRC is even more pronounced 
with almost 60%. The second largest production capacities are in Australia, less concentrated than the reserves. The rest looks pretty similar. Further details around the supply side on this chart with the development until 2026. Australia is a country which has a long history of cobalt mining and new capacities will be coming on stream over the next few years. Indonesia, a rather new player in the cobalt space, will also add capacity. Despite these coming capacity increases in other regions, the DRC is the most important source of cobalt raw materials and the dependence on the DRC will increase over the coming years. It's certainly a high risk for the automotive industry to remain reliant on cobalt from the rather unstable DRC. For the next decade, it seems necessary to secure their cobalt supply through offtake agreements, equity stake, joint ventures, or acquisitions. Of course, the trend is towards cobalt-free batteries, uh, which means using LFP or manganese-rich cathodes. But please keep in mind that in the next few years, cobalt can't be completely avoided as nickel-rich cathodes like NMC811 still consume some cobalt. Also, in case of lithium, there are enough resources and reserves available. The reserve life index of lithium is with around 250 years, five times higher than the one of cobalt. If we have a look at the chart, we see again the reserves highlighted in green and the really installed capacities in gray. Lithium reserves and installed capacities are not distributed similarly in 2022. While South America has the by far largest reserves, the actual installed capacities are located in Australia. Rest of the world in this chart is mainly China. Lithium mining will be more diverse in 2026 than today. Please see Australia shares in 2020 and 2026. Those are decreasing from around 50 to 30%. Many problems with cobalt do not play a role in the lithium market. Lithium mining is geographically diverse and there is no reported child labor. Lithium capacities are found in different continents, Australia, South America, Asia, and North America. Australia is the largest producer where spodumene rock is mined, the largest Lithium brine producer are Chile and Argentina. On the sustainability side, while spodumene ore mining has problems with its carbon footprint, the solution mining of lithium containing brines requires a lot of water in regions where water is already scarce, namely Chile and Argentina. In 2021, more than half of all lithium is sourced from hard rock deposits and around 45% comes from brine. The majority of hard rock mines are located in Australia and China. The majority of brine in Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, as well as China again. Hard rock mining, also called spodumene rock mining, process as every conventional mining activity generates carbon dioxide emissions in the process of excavation and mineral concentration. Most of the projects rely on electricity from the grid 
and fossil fuels for machinery in this process. However, an increasing number of new projects announced uh, of new announced to implement renewable energy sources to power the mines. The output of hard rock mining is a lithium concentrate, which needs to be chemically processed and refined in order to be usable for the battery. These mining and refining processes are geographically far away, uh, which increase the geological footprint. Prime-based mining projects can produce battery grade on-site. However, prime-based lithium mining impacts local communities and environment by using vast quantities of water. Experts disagree uh, on the extent to which lithium mining affects the amount of drinking water available in these areas. Um, as the extracted brine is so heavily salinated that it is undrinkable. An advantage of brine-based mines are the higher energy efficiency. The operations use sun energy in stage of brine evaporation. Before we are moving on to the last chapter, I'd like to share the battery supply chain by region with you based on production capacities. So far, we have discussed the columns with a red rectangle of cobalt and lithium mining. Please have a look at the column named nickel mining, also in a red rectangle, almost in the middle of the slide. As lithium, nickel mining is geographically diverse. Compared to lithium and cobalt, Indonesia uh, colored in pink and rest of APEC in red. The Philippines and New Caledonia are the largest producing countries of nickel miner, mining. China is highlighted in light green. Please note that China does not dominate um, lithium, nickel and cobalt mining. Um, yeah. So let's move on now to the blue rectangle and switch from mining to refining. Here the situation looks different. Light green is the dominant color in all columns, meaning China refines most of all battery raw materials. The same picture um, we can see on the right side for cell manufacturing and recycling. China is the key player in cell manufacturing and battery recycling. To sum up, China dominates the lithium ion battery supply chain from mining, from refining to cell manufacturing and recycling, but not mining. And a drive for localization is slowly leading to diversification. Okay, um, so the question, will supply meet future demand? Can have different meanings. We have already seen there is the difference of resources, reserves, and installed capacities. And obviously, the situation is getting more critical from resources to install capacities. The question can also be asked about refining, for example, if there are enough lithium hydroxide capacity built to supply the new technology trend of nickel-rich cathodes. Let's start with cobalt, uh, where another question is important to address, if there is enough ethical cobalt available or not. This time the supply side is not only about mining, but also about recycling and a focus on the DRC LSM and DRC ASM in red. The shaded area at the top represents the ASM sector. If only rest of the world LSM, DRC LSM and recycling is considered as ethical sources, supply is very tight. However, the shaded area ASM is not per se unethical and there are several initiatives underway to improve this sector. Mm, yeah, it should also be pointed out that 
large-scale mining operations are not necessarily ethical. In the past, cobalt operations, especially in the DRC, were suspect of having used corruption practice around the licensings in the, of the mines. Well, the lithium market is less tight than the one of cobalt. However, as Stefan has discussed before, lithium can't be replaced in the battery. Through all the cathode technology, lithium is consumed, which is a high risk for lithium. Another risk is that different lithium refining products are needed for different cathode technologies, and for one chemical, the market looks even tighter. Let me give you some background information. Um, I will rush a little bit through these slides because uh, that we have maybe time for one or two questions. Um, so let's go let's to the next slide. Yes, I mean, what we have seen before, it was uh, around mining and here it's around refining. Um, we have here the lithium carbonate uh, market and on the other side, the lithium hydroxide. Lithium hydroxide is getting more and more important because of this trend towards high nickel rich cathodes. So we see um, to secure this market or to have enough supply there, it's uh, really tight. But I also like to uh, add here that we can assume that the refining plant is installed way faster than a mining uh, facility so even if it's the even if we have it like a tight situation in 2026 it is in 2026 um, it is still feasible um, to to build these plants and that there is enough material available and here um, you see all the four different uh, battery raw material markets. We discussed the uh, cobalt and lithium on the top and below, in addition, you can also see there is enough nickel and manganese available. I um, extended the supply and demand analysis up to 2030. And here you can see shortages for cobalt, lithium, and nickel. But here it's the same, um, like that's still eight years away uh, where we see the shortages and we can assume that mining capacities are built within this time frame. Yes, and then a few words uh, around our service. Um, so, we, we have like additional analysis, not just around mining. We also cover um, the refining supply demand analysis. And if you buy our service, you also have direct access to the analysts. Then here you can see the binding and yeah, to to come to an end, I'm very curious how we will look back at these predictions, which I have seen um, in years. Will mining availability or ECG of bedroom play a key role, or will recycling be able to meet tremendous electric vehicle demand? Or will we have sodium mine batteries? Let's see. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And we are very happy to take any questions you might have now or offline. Hello, thank you both, uh, Celine and Stefan, for bringing together such a comprehensive uh, presentation. We don't have time for too many questions, so I'll just pick one out uh, for you both from uh, Cedric Herman, who asks uh, to you, Celine. Uh, what place do you see for Ukraine in the supply of raw materials for batteries, lithium, cobalt, um, in the light of the memorandum of understanding between uh, the EU and Ukraine on a strategic partnership on raw materials that was signed last year? Do 
Did you um, say for mining or refining? Or for for which uh, step in the supply chain? Um, um, sorry, rereading it. Um, for the supply of raw materials for batteries um, like lithium and cobalt. It doesn't specify. Okay, yeah. But it doesn't specify. Um, actually, about Ukraine, I haven't heard that much, um, frankly speaking. I hear a lot about Poland when it comes to, oh, yes. yeah, to this area. Um, maybe, Stefan, can you add something around Ukraine? Nope. No, I'm, I'm. I'm afraid. I. I, I also haven't heard of uh, from from the Ukraine. <laughs> so. Oh well, uh, I'll we'll move on from that one then, and we'll see if uh, I can find some more on a source from somewhere else for that. Um, but I've got uh, one question for you, um, for you both, really. Um, you, you, you specifically you, Celine, I suppose, but you showed his uh, reserves from all around the globe. Um, I'm just interested in why is so much mine from the uh, DRC? Um, we have seen like the reserves uh, on the one side, they are in the DRC. And the other thing is um, like the ores, um, the concentration there is very high um compared to other reserves deposits and the other thing is um drc uh, is located at the copper belt so you're not just mining the cobalt you mine it together with the copper mm -hmm. so this makes it even more efficient there are other places um for example in russia where you uh, mined with nickel and also platinum groups metals um, so there, then it's more uh, to, to mine. But in the past, it was really product uh, which they need to get off. Uh, so normally they are just going there and build these plants for the nickel and copper. And yeah, I mean these days when the price is very high, um, it changes a bit the situation. Uh, yeah, it's very uh, cheap, and also the concentrates are very higher in the DRC than in other places. Great, thank you. Unfortunately, I don't have too much time for the other questions asked, but I'll find a way um, if Celine and Stefan can ask, um, answer them post uh, session mm -hmm. and get the answers out. Um, but I just want to say a big thank you to, to both of you for, for the presentation again. It was really right. interesting. Answer questions, stuff like that. Perfect, great. Well, that I think wraps it up. I'd like to say thank you to the audience for tuning in as well. And uh, big thank you to everyone involved.